Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unit 5 of the AP Comparative Review. This covers political and economic changes and development that we see in our CG6 countries and some general trends that we can see as a result of economic liberalization and globalization around the world. So we're going to be focusing on uh, these topics. We'll be looking at impact of global and economic and technological forces. These are kind of the overarching ideas that the College Board says that we need to look at. Political responses to the global market force, um, challenges to um, globalization, also including economic globalization, what it is, and, and that's really kind of a big part of this is what is economic globalization and how is that affected? Um, social policies that come as a result of that, the result of economic development, industrialization, um, how that can affect your uh, demography and the even natural resources. So the big idea is kind of these overarching questions that College Board want us to be thinking about is how do NGOs, non-governmental organizations impact regimes? Um, I always like to have like one NGO to kind of think about, like Amnesty International is one of my personal favorites. Uh, Human, Rights, Human Rights Watch Group is another one that I really like. Uh, Red Cross, you know, think about one, how can they affect uh, impact regimes? Uh, why do governments uh, change policies in favor of public pressure? You know, why, why would they do that? Uh, can economic sanctions affect that? How does, I'll give you one example real quickly. Uh, South Africa, the reason that apartheid ended was because of economic sanctions and that pressure forced them to, to end that. Um, how does this impact the balance of power between citizens and the government? And what are the benefits and drawbacks to a country's natural resource endowment? Think about resource curse and how that can impact a country. Um, you think about how Mexico's economy really declined because they had such um, a dependency that whole like eggs in one basket, that American idiom, that they had such a dependency on oil. You see the same thing even also with Nigeria and the uh, unequal distribution of natural resources. All right, so let's talk a little bit about globalization and what globalization is. Um, so globalization is both good and bad. It has both negative and positive consequences. So two of my, I, I love John Green. Anybody knows anything about me knows that I love John Green and Crash Course. So the globalization one and the globalization two, like one is like the positive things of globalization. And then the globalization two is about kind of the negative consequences. There's also one that is a separate one that it's about poverty and globalization, which is also a really interesting one as well. But when we think about economic globalization, we're talking about how that the world has become more interconnected and how that our market truly is a global market. You think about, like, I, I like to go back to kind of World War II. You think about World War II, after World War I ends, uh, the United States um, was really kind of driving the market and we were uh, really supporting a lot of rebuilding in Germany. So when our market crashed, that really affected Germany. You know, everyone always talks about like how bad our unemployment rate was. Like at the worst, it was 27 percent when it was in the 30s uh, in, in Germany because they had become so dependent upon us. So that is one of the things that happens. It's interconnected. When there is a drop in the Asian market, we feel that in the United States. So um, economic globalization also means it's a reduction of trade barriers and tariffs. And it's that whole kind of uh, being connected. So economic liberalization, when we're thinking about this, uh, what we're talking about is moving to a free market economy. And if you are doing economic liberalization, what you're often doing is what we call neoliberal po economic policies. This would be an example of what Margaret Thatcher did when the conservative party took over in the after the, the Labor Party. The Labor Party had been kind of controlling things after World War II. Remember that they did the beverage report and the collective consensus, which was this whole idea that setting up the UK as a welfare state and providing for people. And Margaret Thatcher argued that, and, and the Conservative Party, that this was, um, there was a big economic downturn in the 1970s, and uh, she blamed the welfare state as one of the reasons that the economy had dipped. So her policies included neoliberal policies, and uh, one of those big ones was privatizing businesses. 
And the opposite of that is nationalizing businesses. Uh, I'll give you another example. We think about Mexico, one of our other CG6. So Pemex, uh, which had been actually established by um, uh, Lazaro uh, Cardenas, who was the one who started the Sejeño, the, the six-year presidential term, he also created Pemex, which was a nationalized oil company. And one of the things that they have done, you know, they had that big dip in oil prices, which really affected them, but they have also privatized more of Pemex. And so... That idea that we're moving from government owned businesses to privately owned businesses. On the other hand, like the opposite of that is that Putin has actually renationalized um, some of the gas industry and oil industries. Remember that natural gas and oil are the big uh, natural resources in Russia. And so he's gone away from economic liberalization in the sense that um, he took businesses that had been privatized under Yeltsin during that shock therapy when they switch from communism to capitalism, like um, um, Yukos Oil, like he prosecuted the, the owner of that and then um, forced his company to be sold at, uh, at auction uh, and was sold off to Gazprom. And so, you know, it could happen in the opposite way. But what we see is that more and more people are moving to market economy. Uh, you also see that China's economy has significantly grown as a result of their economic globalization policies that started under uh, Deng Xiaoping. And Deng Xiaoping, he had that famous quote that it doesn't matter if the mouse is the cat is black or white as long as he catches the mouse. That it doesn't matter if we're using communism, socialism or capitalism as long as we're, the economy is growing. So it's moving to a free market economy, relaxing of government regulations. So if you think back, if you know anything about capitalism and Adam Smith, that whole hands off the laissez faire kind of policy. Um, it also is a reduction of trade barriers and tariffs. Like when you think about Mexico and NAFTA with Canada and the United States of America, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that reduction of barriers. Now, a trend that we see. So this is actually a uh, there's a correlation here. There's a relationship and arguably a causation that the more economic freedom have, the more political freedom they demand. And now we see that this happened in China as people were demanding more political freedoms. They ended up where in Tiananmen Square and the government has has crushed them down. And so it is interesting that China is not allowing that to happen, even though they allow the economic freedom. Um, state membership in the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. So our, our CG6 countries joining those, World Bank, uh, WTO, they also promote economic liberalization policies. IMF is a fascinating thing to me. They will come in. Nigeria was in severe need, bankrupted. They came in. IMF will loan you money, and then they set up a strict repayment plan. And Nigeria not only paid that off, paid off their debt, um, it was really amazing the way that they were committed to that. Um, you can see in this little graph here that comes from the World Bank, uh, a nice little graph that was put together by Mr. Kaneem um, that has the P, um, per capita GDP change. So per capita, remember, is like the average person that someone makes of the gross domestic product. So uh, right when they joined the World Trade Organization and then once and then after, so look at that growth that you see there, China, Mexico, Nigeria, like this would be a great kind of quantitative question that you could see on um, on, a, on an exam where they're asking you to talk about that change in growth, like what led to that, that joining of this, you know, international organization that's promoting economic liberalization. So there are a lot of multinational corporations, you know, Google's probably a really famous multinational corporation. Um, if you've watched some of my videos or know anything about me, I lived overseas for six years. And so I was in Turkey for four and Morocco for two. And I taught in international schools. And the school that I taught in in Turkey had a lot of uh, international uh, businessmen and their children would come to our school. And they often um, we had from Boeing, uh, we had and then there's other ones that people were coming to to our school. So with multinational corporations, they really are the ones who are dominating kind of the global market, um, but they can prove, uh, pose challenges to the countries and sometimes conflict with the domestic policies that countries have um, with taxes that they don't want to pay or how they treat the environment or how they provide labor, land rights, things like that. Here's some other examples of some multinational corporations that do operate within the CG6. Several of those you can probably identify with Nigeria, with the oil there. So globalization and neoliberalism um, can also lead to 
conflict within uh, the states that we're talking about. And so we can see that there are increased demands placed by civil society groups as they maybe aren't happy with things. Um, as a result of growth, there can be problems. For example, you're going to get environmental issues and people are going to protest. There also is going to be an increasingly gap between uh, the rich and the poor. I mean, what was, you know, Marx talked about that, how that capitalism really produces a wealth inequality and that the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Um, even just access to education or access to other government services, that can be a challenge. When we look at, um, you know, Boko Haram, they're unhappy about the Western involvement. Um, Mosab and Mind are both in, also in Nigeria and in that Niger Delta, kind of pushing for their independence. Um, and breaking away the Zapatista movement, which was in Mexico and completely opposed to NAFTA. Uh, even the Scottish independence movement, um, who wanted to leave Britain because they, you know, they, they don't like this whole, the Brexit, the leaving of the European Union. So what is the political response to the global markets? Um, we can see that, you know, they, they try to think about what policies and some of the things that they've done is, for example, the special economic zones or the SEZs along the coast of China. And so these are um, cities or areas that I, it's almost like if you go back to if those of you who may be a world history minded, your spheres of influence. And so these are areas of China. So like Macau or Hong Kong that have special permission to have a trade with foreigners and invest foreign investment. And so they're much more open to this capitalist market under that kind of a uh, one country, two system started under uh, Deng Xiaoping. Um, you also see, as I mentioned, Pemex before. I also mentioned the renationalization of the, the oil things. And so uh, the oil in um, oil companies and natural gas companies in Russia. So some of the countries provide more private control of natural resources versus like Iran, which nationalizes their oil. Uh, and, you know, Iran gets so much money from the oil that don't even have to tax their people. The United Kingdom has the most private control of natural resources, and China, of course, has uh, the least. So when we think about the challenges to globalization, really we, we look at and how that uh, direct investment and multinational corporations can challenge uh, the sovereignty of the country because they may not like the policies that the government has. Uh, and then there is, again, as I mentioned already, kind of that backlash because they don't like the cultural influences that are coming from uh, the West. And we definitely can see in China how their rapid industrialization has led to massive air pollution, massive uh, water pollution. Uh, and foreign governments uh, can also bring political and economic pressure, like the economic sanctions that I mentioned previously, um, what people not wanting to trade with China because of human rights violations, uh, issues with Iran because of nuclear uh, issues, the whole, do they have nukes? Do they not have nukes? Uh, and so all of these could be things that are, are tied into this. So when we think about um, the courses we look at, there's different ways that we can measure economic development, economic growth. Uh, and one of those best ways to do that is actually through the Human Development Index. And this kind of takes a measure of several different things and then ranks countries. And you can easily Google any of this data. And uh, these charts I just thought were super nicely put together by Mr. Kaneen. So I have borrowed them from his uh, Citizen U uh, comparative corner. So Human Development Index, you know, United States is a very high one. And we look at this, I would hope that none of this would surprise you based on your knowledge of the CG6, but this would just kind of reinforce things that you already knew. Um, the highest in the world on the HDI, if you're curious, it's going to be your Scandinavian countries. Uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland always rank at the top. Uh, the Gini coefficient is very interesting when we're looking at uh, equality or inequality. And so what we're looking at is um, the lower your score, the higher your score kind of thing, uh, the, the, is, you know, where your, your inequalities are when we're looking at in countries. So you go to score of zero, you're going to have a perfect equality, meaning that all citizens are equal. So the lower your number is, the more equality is. The higher your number, the more inequality is, the bigger the gaps are between the wealthy and the poor. And, um, 
you know, I would would argue, you know, it's the China's the one that's maybe surprising that they aren't more equal, which, again, how communist really are they? So another way that we can look at things is uh, looking at um, GDP and GDP growth rate. So GDP is another, you know, indicator that we can look at. You can look at things like how many doctors are there for every person, uh, look at live births, uh, look at how many, you know, survive, what's your infant mortality rate, what's your life expectancy, what is your literacy rate. All of these are things that help us determine your human development. Um, when we look at uh, GDP, um, the United States and China constantly are going back and forth. Uh, the China surpassed the United States in 2019 or 2020. And then uh, it's very close right now. I forget at the moment who is currently uh, at, at the head. Uh, the growth rate, though, look at this. Uh, you know, China's growth rate has been significant as they continue with their uh, economic liberalization policies. So international and supranational organizations can also have influence. I've already mentioned IMF, World Bank. Uh, WTO, you know, think about this. Um, and remember that countries can get assistance loans from IMF, but they have strict rules that you have to follow in order to, to do that. Uh, ECOWAS is uh, the economic uh, community of Western African states. Nigeria is a member of ECOWAS. The EU, uh, which Britain is leaving. Uh, WTO, they have sovereign powers. So remember that a supranational organization they have sovereign powers over your national governments, meaning that you're giving up some sovereignty in order to be a part of those. And you, their laws supersede your national laws. Uh, but there are benefits for being part of a supranational organization. And being part of WTO really helps your, your economy. All right. So uh, Mr. Kaneen has again provided some fantastic questions for us to look at. And so we're going to look at here a sample argumentative essay from Unit 5. So remember, uh, we came up with a little acronym in my class. It's called PISR, uh, P-S-R. So you have to have a prompt. You got to restate the prompt. You got to pick a side. And then you got to provide your reasoning. This is to help us write our thesis. So we're going to assess the relationship between the decentralization of power and GDP growth rate. And we're going to use the following course concept in your response, which is neoliberalism. In your response, you should do the following. Respond to the prompt with a defensible claim or thesis that establishes a line of reasoning using the provided course concept. Support your claim with at least two specific and relevant evidence from one or more of these countries, China, Mexico, and the UK, and the evidence should be relevant to the course concept. So take a minute. Pause me and take a minute and assess uh, and write down an answer and then come back. Wait, so you're still with me or either you've just returned. So uh, when we look at this, this is the kind of the key things that I would be looking for if I was thinking of reading your answer. Like, what do we want to look for? So it is easy to argue that countries that have implemented neoliberalism see a direct correlation between their growth rate and the decentralization of power. So what we see is that using neoliberal policies, which remember, what is neoliberalism? You're going to want to define that at some point, that you know what you're talking about here, that they are privatizing businesses, that they are having a reduction in trade tariffs or trade barriers, uh, and you want to talk foreign investment, all of those kind of things and move to a free market economy. And in doing so, that means that the government has to give up some control. And so that's your decentralization of power. And what you see as a result of that is GDP growth. And so um, as countries take on neoliberal policies, they do see a GDP growth rate, but they also have to give up some power. And then you want to think of like specific examples. So joining a supranational organization, okay, like that's your part of your line of reasoning. So being a part of a WTO, how that joining WTO led to China having, you know, increased GDP growth along with neoliberal uh, policies such as allowing for private ownership of business, something that was completely forbidden, you know, under Mao. Uh, that's just an extra piece of information, not something that's going to necessarily get you a point, but shows, you know, your knowledge. Um, you can talk about how that um, Mexico, how that they are privatizing Pemex, uh, their membership in NAFTA. So you want to give specific 
examples. You can talk about the UK when they joined the EU, like kind of the benefit that they saw for that. Um, you know, you give up, remember, some sovereignty in order to do that. But on the other hand, you know, the join, the exiting the vote in 2016, um, that they were skeptical, you know, of the government, you know, kind of continuing that process. All right. So, again, I'm not going through the whole thing, but hopefully giving you enough to kind of get you started and, and be thinking about the answer. All right. So we've got one more sample question here. Again, this is from uh, Mr. Uh, Andrew Kaneen, who is one of the co-authors of Citizen U. And this guy knows what he's talking about because he used to be uh, one of the writers for the AP comparative uh, test. Now, he's not anymore, which is why he's able to write these questions and share them with teachers. And I'm able to share them with you. But when I say he knows what he's talking about, he knows what he's talking about. OK, um, he's uh, been a he's constantly, you know, a reader and has been a table leader, question leader. You know, this so when you're looking at those kind of things, there are things to consider um, as a teacher that, you know, who are your sources of information kind of thing. Um, and we we as teachers, we all make mistakes. So there is probably some point in here that I have misspoke. Um, I know just in reviewing some of my things from another one, like that David Cameron called for the UK referendum vote for Brexit. And I think I said Theresa May in a different video. And so we all have those moments where we get a little bit confused. So we appreciate when you give us a little bit of grace. Uh, so here is a sample quantitative essay that would uh, come from unit five. So if you think about, remember, we're going to have an argumentative, a quantitative, you're going to have a concept basic question, you know, like some kind of what is economic liberalization? And it would be about that. It's not country specific. And then you're going to have your, your country comparison question. All right. Explain how a pattern of data in the table demonstrates neoliberalism in Nigeria. All right. So we know what neoliberalism is. Let's look at our data. It says uh, per capita GDP since joining the WTO. All right. So we can see there is growth. Now, we actually already looked at a chart like this earlier, right? Didn't we? And um, the only one who's gone down is Russia, right? But let's. the question is not about Russia at this point. It's talking about Nigeria, right? So Nigeria, we see the, the pattern of data. So as they have joined WTO, so joining a supranational organization um, and reducing trade barriers and incurring foreign investment through trade, they have increased. That's part of neoliberalism, right? And so they have increased their GDP. Uh, so you want to remember, explain the pattern. So we want to say what neoliberalism is, and then you want to tie that to Nigeria, relating back to that. As you can see in the data chart, Nigeria's per capita has increased by almost $2,000. You don't want to say percentages or whatever, just say like the numbers, okay? You could even say increase from 264 in 1995 to $2,000.28. Using the data on the table, draw a conclusion about Russia's relationship with supranational organizations. So theirs has declined. What does that mean? Does that mean that they're unwilling to give up sovereignty to those nations? Hmm, possibly. That would be the conclusion uh, that I potentially would draw. Um, you can think about that, that they did not benefit. You know, that's a, the easy answer is that they clearly did not benefit Although most countries do, in this case, Russia did not benefit uh, from this. So we saw a decline. And uh, remember that WTO as a supranational requires, you know, to give up some some sovereignty, some authority. And they may have declined uh, because they had difficulty in competing. Uh, and they may be... Um, we could argue maybe even they face some economic sanctions because of Crimea. Just thought about that. How that Crimea, when they invaded Crimea, that the, the world wasn't very happy about that. Okay. Possibly because what time period are we looking at? I'm going to pause real quick and look up what year they invaded Crimea. Just Google search ever. Uh, 2014. So, yes, that definitely could be a result of that. All right, explain how the data and the table relates to political legitimacy in China. So we see a massive uh, growth here. Uh, so usually a lot of legitimacy for a government comes from elections. Don't have elections in China. 
So therefore, they're arguing, hey, look how good our policies are. Look how good our uh, our government is, because look at our economy. Look at that massive amount of economic growth. OK, and so that's where they're going to talk about that their political legitimacy comes from, because it's not coming from elections. OK, I hope this has helped you prepare uh, my CG6 video. Uh, really just reviews all of the things about comparative government uh, with the specific uh, comparative government countries of Mexico, UK, Russia, China, Iran, and Nigeria. And I have two uh, related to that. And you please, uh, well, there, there's one video and then the, in the little doobly-doo uh, link for that video, which I will put down uh, here you can find uh, a, a PDF that has lots of great information in it. So uh, don't forget to be awesome and best wishes on your AP comparative government test. Thanks for watching.